Hi, I'm uh, Professor Vicky Karku from um, Edge Hill University, uh, Director of the Research Center for Arts and Wellbeing. And uh, I'm here with the um, WHO lead for arts and wellbeing and prominent arts therapists from around the world. Um, we're here to discuss the role of the arts and art therapies in the pandemic. Um, on behalf of um, Edge Hill University and the Research Center for Arts and Wellbeing, I would like to welcome you all to this session that attracted uh, uh, quite a number actually of delegates highlighting how important this topic has been for people from around the world. Um, this was an event that was uh, originally planned to um, um, go live um, and uh, it has been organized in collaboration oh. with the um, International Arts Therapist Doctor Alliance that is uh, chaired by um, Dr. Nisa Satsnani from New York University. And I'm going to um, bring Nisa in now to introduce the topic and the panelists. Thank you, Vicki, and it's a pleasure to co-host this event uh, with you and with all of our wonderful panelists. I think we'll have a wonderful discussion here focusing on this primary question of how the arts and arts therapies contribute to health and well-being in the context of the pandemic. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to have Christopher Bailey with us uh, today. Christopher is the lead for the arts and health for the World Health Organization and a performer and director in his own right. And we're also joined by Professor Felicity Baker, who's the head of music therapy and director of the International Research Partnerships for the Creative Arts and Music Therapy Research Unit at Melbourne University. We have Dr. Aziza Abdullah, who's a senior lecturer in expressive arts, counseling and psychology at University Uttara Malaysia. She's also a registered counselor with the Malaysian Board of Counselors and a member of the National Counseling Educator Association in Malaysia. And we have Professor Vicky Karku, of course, who's the director of the Research Center for the Arts and Wellbeing at Edge Hill and is a qualified dance movement therapist and also the joint program leader for the MSc in Psychotherapy and Counseling Contemporary Creative Approaches. Um, we're gonna begin with an opening statement from uh, Christopher and then we will move towards our panelists and then open up the conversation. So I'll pass it to you now, Christopher. Well, thanks so much, uh, Nisha, and greetings, everyone, uh, from Geneva. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll begin, first of all, to explain my rather funky lenses. I uh, am virtually blind. I have terminal glaucoma and less than 5% vision. Uh, about a, a year ago, um, a little more than a year ago, I lost the ability to recognize faces. And... It, what, what was interesting to me, when you lose something so fundamental, there are, of course, different coping mechanisms that come into play. And in my life, since I am in some ways half in the world of science and half in the world of arts, both came into play. I'll talk a little bit about science now, and then towards the end of my uh, 20 minutes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, my artistic reaction to it. But one of the things that gave me comfort was trying to understand what was happening to me. And as I would try and make sense of the world with so little visual information coming into my visual cortex, I began to realize what the visual cortex was about. It, it represents one fifth of the brain's capacity and part of its function is, is to take that information and try and make sense of it, to find patterns. And when you're getting a paucity of information, it begins to fill in the blanks. And that resulted with me with hallucinations, where I would take a walk in a neighboring park in, in Switzerland and see a palm tree. I would run into a, a, an old friend and see them as if we were just meeting each other 20 years ago. So there are some advantages to it. Um, what, I, what I began to realize quite dramatically in terms of our perception is what Wordsworth and others saw in their poetry generations earlier, that our experience of the world is half of what we see 
and the other half what our mind creates. And it, our, our systems abhor a vacuum like nature. So when we look up at the stars, it is impossible for us to imagine randomness. So we take that randomness and we begin to impose an order. And that order is drawn from the stories of our culture, from our personal experiences, and we project that back out onto the randomness and it becomes the constellations. This is particularly true in a time of crisis like a pandemic. In the early phases of a pandemic where the need for information is so great and the stakes are so high and the actual availability of information is so low, like my glaucoma, we begin to see patterns that aren't there. And this is how rumors start. And, and it's why the scientific method is so important to be able to take this very human quality of, of myth making from little information and begin to separate out what is verifiable fact through the scientific process and what is a comforting story. Um, the, the, in, in, in the pandemic, we are facing essentially two epidemics. The first is viral that we're aware of. The second is of misinformation and sometimes disinformation. And this is nothing new. Uh, when, when I was um, on the ground working with teams in the 2014 Ebola epidemic in West Africa, and we would go into a community or, or a village, Oftentimes, when we would explain why you need to wash your hands, why safe burial practices are important, um, why a body might need to be given over for proper, proper burial, sometimes the people in the village would respond and say, yes, that makes sense. But often, there would be a fear reaction, and they would blame the messenger they would say, well, we, we didn't have this disease until you people started telling us about it. Maybe you're bringing it. Um, all sorts of, of, of strange uh, rumors coming out of fear and, and hope uh, as well. And so when the COVID-19 pandemic began to arise and WHO itself came under attack uh, and, and, and other um, equally prominent and authoritative organizations, and, and new rumors of potential uh, cures or, or treatments or uh, denials that it's even happening uh, or anger at, at people bringing what little information we had or anger that we didn't have all the information up front. All of this is not a surprise. It is a human reaction because when faced with little information, we always try and find the narrative. And it's very, very hard to accept when the narrative hasn't been written yet. Part of the role of the scientist is to be disciplined and through the scientific method, find out what is true and what is not, to apply it to a crisis, which is very difficult when time is an issue. And part of the role of the artist is to give expression to that anxiety and begin to make sense of it in an authentic way and imagine the future. So how do we do this at WHO? Well, we do it at the local level uh, with comedians, uh, improvisational acting troops. Uh, we have a network of artists around the world. Uh, as part of it is not just the health messaging of telling people what they can do to, to break the transmission chain, but also, to give an authentic voice to people's actual experience. Communication goes both ways, it's both talking and listening. And artists are uniquely positioned to be that interlocutor between the heart and the mind. The most famous example of a response that WHO had 
in this particular moment is probably the Together at Home concert that we did with Global Citizen and Lady Gaga and my uh, colleague Paul Garwood uh, did a, a lot of the heavy lifting on. And just to take that for a moment, that concert was broadcast simultaneously across almost every major broadcast and digital channel around the world. It, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, and I know it's true because we got the email from them, we broke records for the amount of money raised uh, in an online fundraising benefit and the number of groups booked for it. So we're good for bar bets for the rest of our lives. But the other thing that this concert did, it worked on several levels. On one level, we got the message across to wash your hands, to maintain physical distancing, to stay at home, to support each other. All the key public health messages that we, we wanted out there were delivered in a way that people could hear. The other thing that we accomplished was providing a sense of comfort and community. Together at Home was a conscious title that part of the goal in all of this was solidarity, that just as the fear reaction to create myths around a crisis is, is a human one and common, so too is the, the impulse to run away from each other, to, to not stand together. And we've seen historically in epidemics, in pandemics, that when you exclude, when you divide, it only intensifies the this ferocity uh, of the epidemic. But when you stand together emotionally and intellectually, that epidemic comes under control, even if you are physically distant. Um, the other aspect that began to emerge from that concert was, was an immediate identification with the celebrities. And this gets back to the unique role of performance and art. In life, it takes time through repeated positive interactions to build trust with people. And certainly with scientists and academics who are spouting data and facts, and it, there's, there's a tendency for them to feel distant and aloof and, and not feel a personal connection with them. And so even if they are telling you facts that will save your life, the trust is not in the intellectual part of the brain. The trust is in the midbrain, the relationships, the, the sense of identity. And, and this is the place of narrative, of story, of art. And so what happens when you go into a performance space, you have a leap of faith. You, you immediately, short circuit that that time consideration to build trust in a relationship and you automatically trust this fictional character or this celebrity from this imagined relationship and it's a way of being able to have instant trust uh, and it, it's something that has evolved in our species from performance from the beginning and it, it's something that we need to be aware of uh, to to use it in in a positive and constructive way and then the last uh, element that came out of this concert, beyond solidarity, the messaging, the comfort, was something that I only heard about yesterday. I was on a panel with the Aspen Institute and the subject came up and uh, some of the academics there said, you know, what we're hearing from the younger generation is that a whole generation of people were exposed to public health and health sciences through that concert. And they're hearing children not only having the agency to do something to help in the pandemic by washing their hands, et cetera, but realizing the beauty of, of being able to help others in a systematic science-based way. And, and, and many of them saying that they're seriously thinking about a career in the medical sciences or public health, which is not something that was an objective of ours, but a beautiful thing to hear. What is this connection between art and health? It is very old. If we go back in time to the very first healing ceremonies, what we'll find is that the healing ceremony 
was the same thing as a theatrical performance, as a musical performance, as an athletic event, as a religious event. There was no difference. And still, all, all of these things were separated for very realistic and practical reasons over the millennia, still share some common DNA. And that common DNA, I think, can be identified by two events that happened about 70,000 years ago at the midpoint in the evolution of our species, something called the cognitive revolution. And it wasn't our ability to think. That had already been established. The first sign of this cognitive revolution was painting a human figure on a wall with an animal's head a work of the imagination, something that does not actually exist in nature that was created in someone's mind and given representation. The second event that happened was the first archeological evidence of a healed broken femur. Prior to that event, if you broke your femur, you were left to die. You would be a liability to the tribe. But at some point in our minds, we conceptualized that sacrificing the efficiency of the tribe to stay and care for that injured person had a value. That person was worth it to the tribe. In both instances, two things were happening. One was a sense of compassion and empathy. Empathy is the, the driver of the arts. It's also the driver of healthcare. The other thing that's happening at the beginning of artistic and, and basically scientific inquiry is this notion of the magic what if. To take the information around you and imagine what could be that sense-making ability. In science, we call that the hypothesis. And then we go through the scientific method to see whether that's actually true or not. In the arts, the magic what if serves a different purpose. It's, it's to create a, a reality, an emotional reality, by which we can help understand what's happening. And if we go back to ancient Greek theater, their notion of catastrophe I think speaks to this process well and, and perhaps shows the role of the artist in an event like COVID-19. The Greeks had a very specific definition of catastrophe. It was different than a disaster. A disaster is something terrible that happens. There's nothing you can do about it. Too bad, right? In a catastrophe, the event is the same. There's no difference. But if you can, find a meaning in it, it becomes an overturning, an overturning of the social structure. In the catastrophe of COVID-19, suddenly politicians are powerless and, and we are all dependent upon green grocers. There is a social overturning. We find a meaning in it in my own personal journey into blindness, when I first realized that I was losing my vision and my engagement of the world was threatened, it felt like a kind of a death. And I went through all the stages of death, of anger, of grief, of bargaining, of denial, and eventually acceptance, but more than acceptance, it was making it part of my identity and this, was not a natural state. This is not a medical thing that happened to me. This was an act of the imagination and of will on my part. To describe it to you, when you willingly close your eyes to sip a glass of vintage red wine to better taste its flavor, when you willingly close your eyes to better embody a piece of music. When you willingly close your eyes 
to trace the gentle slope of a lover's forearm. So too do I willingly close my eyes to better live this moment with you. That's the healing power of art. I think that's the end of my 20 minutes. This is, um, I'm, I'm lifting, uh, I'm, I'm living a bit of a moment to just um, stay with uh, your final um, statement there, uh, Christopher. Thank you very much for that. And I, I, I think I'm going to pass on uh, the, um, uh, pass it on to the community now to see how um, uh, music in particular, music therapy can um, um, add to that, to what Christopher has um, uh, already discussed and presented. So Felicity. Uh, uh, thank you, Vicky, and thank you, Christopher. I, I almost uh, don't know where to start now. I'm kind of moved myself from the last statement. My apologies. No, 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 don't apologize at all. It's, um, it, was, it was wonderful. And you've touched on so many of the, the things that were already going on in my mind about, about the power of music. You talked about music quite a lot in the concert. Um, and, I, and I think that, that that's probably a good, way, a good segue for me to talk about song in particular, because uh, you talked about hygiene and the way these, uh, these people watching the concert were being informed about hygiene. And, and certainly we know that, that people learn through, through song uh, and kids in particular are, are connected with song. And it actually wasn't part of what I thought about when I was going to talk about um, the role of music therapy in, in, in the COVID pandemic, but certainly for young people, learning through song is important. I guess um, given that you've talked, Christopher, quite a lot about kind of the community uh, impact of the arts, I thought I might I was going to talk a little bit about that, but I might focus a little bit more on therapy specifically, because we know that a lot of a lot of people uh, with various health challenges aren't able to access uh, the creative arts in any of any um, modality in the same way that um, that more that normal typically developing people and and well people can. Uh, and certainly for in, the, in the case of music therapy, we know that music is, has this capacity to kind of connect people in the virtual world. Uh, so we will have seen already through social media um, that many people are writing their own songs, uh, often in, in the form of parodies, uh, which they're using to um, express their, um, their challenges in uh, during this time of self-isolation that we've been all forced to do uh, unexpectedly and mostly unwillingly um, and uh, these these song parodies are often can be quite humorous and they're kind of giving people a chance to take a break in a way from the heaviness and the seriousness of the pandemic and turn this into i guess a, a humorous reflection and, and through these, these parodies, um, you, you, can, you can see that people are sharing them widely. And I get them myself from, from uh, colleagues and from family members through, you know, Messenger and things where they're sharing, check this song out. And, you know, um, all the things that we, have, that we find challenging about being in isolation can be uh, expressed through song. And, and we can kind of laugh about it, laugh about ourselves and our own reaction to that. But thinking about um, people uh, who might have complex disabilities, people with dementia, um, older people who are isolated now as a result of the pandemic, they can't go out, they're afraid to go out, and they're isolated. Uh, they're sitting at home all the time. Uh, and so we can use music therapy in many ways to support these people and, 
And certainly, you know, this whole field of telemedicine has exploded in music therapy. Um, we just actually did a survey of our Australian Music Therapy Association members. And I got the results only this afternoon, actually, and I haven't been through them uh, in, in a lot of detail yet, but it's just scanning the, the initial, initial data. It's, it's looking like um, people are actually really engaged in, in making music online and are saying sometimes that it's actually more enjoyable than the sometimes the face-to-face -face interactions that we might have. And if we think, for example, people, um, young people who are on the spectrum, they engage with technology, right? And they, they can find face-to-face um, -face interaction sometimes much, um, much more confronting and, and intense than, than a screen, which kind of gives them a little sense of distance. Maybe I'll we'll come to some other points um, as we have our, our discussion. Um, Felicity, thank you. That's a, a little taste of uh, um, a music therapy from Australia. And not only, the online world brings us to a, a, a very international uh, front here, really, doesn't it? Um, should we move to Malaysia and uh, um, um, uh, Aziza? Aziza, would you like to um, uh, give us a sense of what's happening in Malaysia and what's happening in art therapy and expressive art therapies? Okay, uh, thank you, Wiki. And uh, when I listened to uh, what Christopher and Felicity shared just now, I want to share about my personal experience based on my discipline and uh, the recent project that we developed in response to uh, COVID-19. Uh, I engage with uh, many mental health practitioners uh, working in variety of settings. We work with uh, children, with young people, with elderly, but when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, suddenly hit the situation change and uh, when I experienced uh, to connect with my student too, we try to develop something different instead of face-to-face uh, -face because we cannot meet around. So we established the online uh, service. And uh, what uh, inspired me because I received image, weird image at the middle of night image about uh, emotional breakdown. So I think this is the time for me to uh, do something for my uh, people here. And uh, what uh, Christopher mentioned just now about uh, expressive art psychotherapy that I will uh, explain. This is not only uh, evident from the normal situation, but also during the COVID-19 uh, crisis it's a very powerful approach to engage with uh, people. And uh, in response to the focus of our discussion today, I would like to highlight about the therapeutic power of symbolization process. Because when uh, people stay at home, isolation, far away from everybody, uh, they need something to uh, channel their inner emotion. They need a uh, something to project uh, about their mind thinking and what uh, they experience at home. So expressive art offer this, uh, uh, this challenging situation. And this is very important because uh, expressive art can uh, engage in a multiple modality. For example, like for children, maybe uh, they always play because play is children communication, way of communication. So they can uh, express through play. For young people, like uh, just now Felicity mentioned about uh, young people, uh, nowadays new generation, they are very uh, skillful in IT, in ICT uh, communication. So this is the time that I feel I need to establish something to develop a project uh, that uh, we call a protocol for face-to-face -face and uh, online psychological support uh, during the COVID pandemic. But because my background from expressive art psychotherapy, so I introduced uh, another way curl instead of just uh, verbal therapy for this. And uh, for me, this is something, a very powerful approach uh, to help uh, people adapt with the new norms, the different uh, lifestyle. With, uh, like uh, expressive also can help to connect with uh, nature and surrounding environment. Like just now, I heard uh, Christopher Bailey, Christopher mentioned about the uh, 
trust relationship. That's something very important because for those trapped at home, they don't know where to go. Even we have like uh, hotline tele support, but they don't know uh, the people. And what we try, the first I uh, train my student first, I train them to establish the trust relationship that uh, they can provide the psychological safety and also psychological freedom for those need to express. Because uh, once they express something, this something beyond words. Uh, for example, I mentioned about the image that I received in uh, the middle of the night, a very weird image, image like uh, very uh, highly emotional, depressed, anxiety, and some image show they want to commit suicide. So that's uh, something uh, could worry me. And I say to my student, because you are not uh, skillful yet in doing this, so I need to take over. And uh, once I take over, I feel this not enough for only uh, me, if only me, uh, to help uh, these uh, people in need. So I open for like online, uh, like uh, sharing, uh, discussion and training uh, to help them to handle the situation. And uh, is it four minutes already? Uh, <laughs> okay, so I, uh, what I want to say to conclude for this uh, first introduction, expressive art psychotherapy enable us to explore and understand uh, the feeling, the uh, personal meaning from uh, those uh, perspective, like just now the last word that uh, Christopher shared about, uh, I, 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 I take that word about, we need to understand from others window not from our window using expressive art okay i think that's enough thank you thank you aziza um, um i i it, it's interesting to um, i'm thinking how uh, through your um you know the expressive arts therapist we have a number of different modalities integrated there but the the principles remain the same in, in many ways. And, and I'm thinking about drama therapy that we're moving on to now and NISA. Um, um, we also have drama and drama therapy um, um, is a multimodal um, approach in many ways. So Nisa, would you like to uh, take over and uh, sure. share your response to Chris's work and what's happening in New York and drama therapy? I'll pick it up from what you just said, which is that drama does tend to incorporate multiple art forms. Um, you, you know, it can involve movement, it can involve song, and of course involve story. And that theaters, as Christopher was saying, um, have from the, you know, from time immemorial also been places of uh, healing, uh, largely because the theater offers us in its rituals, a reflection of life as it was, as it is and as it could be, sometimes inviting the audience to imagine themselves into a future that doesn't exist yet, providing words, modeling feelings, um, interactions that we did not even know we needed, um, and uh, uh, offers us a sense of stability then in times of chaos in the sense that it can, uh, it can catalyze a meaning-making process. Um, I was thinking too about um, chaos and instability. Christopher had referenced some of the um, immediate needs that we feel um, when when faced with a you know a, a massive sea change like the pandemic. And in a sea change, you want to develop sea legs. We want to be able to try to rock with the instability of the sea. But that's easier said than done because this pandemic is a bit like riding a bicycle in the middle of an earthquake. So we're really seeking, you know, some stable ground. Um, and from a therapeutic perspective, and this is true, I would say, in classrooms as well, because of course I'm, I'm an educator as well as a drama therapist. You know, when we're working with groups, one of the things that I've noticed has become really important uh, is coming back to those rituals that we used when we when we first met together. So what were the rituals that helped us begin a group? What were the rituals that helped us end a group? And that returning to some of those rituals with an easy and slow pace allows us to stabilize again, to come back to something known, something comforting, to come back into a sense of connection with each other. And maybe on the level of connection, um, Christopher had spoken about trust and the ways in which we 
um, impart or, or confer trust over to those we may not know, but who we've seen enough of. They're, they're visible figures, they're um, known to us in some way. Uh, you know, they become, um, um, they're able to spread, uh, spread the message, the public health messages that we need to hear uh, in a way where people will listen. And I'm thinking about uh, a psychological concept of social buffering, which uh, arose about 60 years ago, which, you know, simply put, speaks to the need, our need to affiliate with other people in order to mitigate stress. And in the absence of uh, other people, um, we have what an, another colleague of mine, David Johnson, has referred to as imaginal social buffering. We imagine the other. And we imagine the other in the stories that we create with one another. And of course, we call each other to mind, our friends and our family. Some of us are sheltering with other people, of course, and maybe three months or four months in, we would do, uh, we would like to do a little, with a little less social buffering uh, because we've been in the same room for a very long time. <laughs> but, uh, but just to say that, you know, it's our social relationships, of course, that help us manage the stress of this environment or stress of this situation, I should say. And so one of the other ways that theater uh, has adapted and that drama therapy has adapted uh, in this time has been to find ways to continue to tell stories, uh, to take traumatic memory, to take difficult experiences and move them into um, a, a story structure, a narrative structure, a bit like connecting the stars uh, that you spoke to earlier, Christopher. And, uh, you know, we found, for example, we um, had uh, held a, what could be referred to as a, a happening uh, earlier in May, at the beginning of May, and about 350 care providers and arts therapists came together from 35 countries to share stories about what it was to, to live during this time, what it was to practice during this time. And in our survey of them afterwards, we asked them, what was the most beneficial about that experience? And uh, many of them spoke to the experience of organizing a narrative. So even before they came and joined us here in this online platform, the invitation to go and artfully organize an experience already gave them a sense of distraction, a sense of purpose, and a bit of artistry, a way of creating an aesthetic frame um, around disparate, somewhat incoherent experiences to bring them into coherence and then second, you know, secondarily coming into this environment, sharing it with others, and then witnessing other people's experiences. Witnessing other people's experiences uh, was actually, I think, at the top. So just needing what we've always needed since the beginning of time, to sit around a fire, to hear each other's stories, and to, help, to have those stories help us orient ourselves in our current time and place uh, as we look towards the future. I'll leave it there. Over to you, Vicki. Thank you, thank you. And I, I, I guess I um, you, you spoke a lot about uh, stories, and I know stories have become a, a recurrent theme here. Um, I'm going to um, talk about different type of stories, stories that have no words as a dance movement psychotherapist, just to flag that up as well as a, um, a, an important presence because our bodies is what we carry ourselves with and what um, in, a, in a lockdown and social distancing and isolation and it, it carries so much in there. So that's the, the, the domain of, of dance and dance movement psychotherapy. Um, we've seen in the lockdown all sorts of things happening in terms of uh, um, dancing in the street and trying to connect from people's doorsteps and um, um, we sort of went wild with uh, doing dance classes from, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, practitioners in New York and in Australia and Israel and you name it, you know, sort of really as, as a way of taking care of ourselves, it became a very important um, a thing for our self-care. Um, so that's one point in terms of bringing the body and bringing the body in and out in a way, in a, in a, in a, in a contradictory way because our out has been a doorstep or the walk in the park and um, so that's that's one point that becomes important and um, the other point I think for me is that a um, 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 uh, point that Chris raised before about the difference between science and um, art and uh, I think as a dance movement psychotherapist and as an academic 
I spend a lot of time trying to create a, a link between the two. So all is not imagined. And we have verifiable things as well that are happening. And, um, and uh, we have things we know, for example, dance and dance movement psychotherapy and all the other art therapies. We have a really growing evidence in terms of uh, how um, effective um, and the disciplines are in tackling depression, for example. Depression in particular is a really strong component. And, 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 and uh, it's an area that uh, we know um, um, people are more affected by because of the lockdown and loneliness and isolation and all of that. And there is a lot for us as art therapists and certainly I can claim for dance movement psychotherapy we can uh, make a contribution there and you know alleviate some of the distress that is associated with that. So we have evidence from uh, um, randomized control trials from um, um, studies with, uh, which are seen as uh, uh, of high value and uh, rigor in terms of uh, outcomes. And um, we are also working now and we're working collaboratively and in uh, the, uh, our sub-disciplines on defining why this is the case. And in and, and dance movement psychotherapy, I would say that a couple of things that are extremely important, uh, when we're working with people with depression, um, uh, we um, um, need to find ways of recharging. Um, um, uh, uh, it's, I, I, I keep thinking that there's something about, you know, the batteries being empty and dance form in itself has the, the capacity to offer, you know, sort of uh, this uh, uh, kickstart of some kind. So we have things like rhythm and playfulness that really can, can revitalize uh, people. And uh, we can do things that um, 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 have to do with um, um, caring for ourselves through mindful movement or through uh, breathing exercises. So it's really basic body-based stuff that uh, uh, create changes. And um, we talked about relationships, important, extremely important. The relationships in a dance therapy context are non-verbal, are kinesthetic, um, and can be done through mirroring, um, can be done through symbolic movement communication. They don't necessarily, they can have words there as well, but it's not as important. Um, and we can work with uh, um, uh, quite varied, difficult stuff as well and bring them in the foreground. And if we have a qualified therapist as well in a frame that is safe and contained, we can uh, process material um, before we move forward. So with um, trying out new things, what have we discovered? What are the things that we found out? Can we experiment and learn new ways of being in the world? And, creating movement narratives and movement um, summaries of our journey of transformation and change. So these are some uh, important components, I think, that the discipline of dance movement psychotherapy can bring to the table, but also, you know, sort of they speak, translating it to the different modality can speak for the other art therapies as well, I think. Um, the other thing we talk about public um, 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 public health messaging. Um, um, we have uh, nurses in hospitals doing uh, social distancing dances, um, uh, dance for release after um, um, working long hours in hospitals for nurses. Um, we also um, currently we're working on. Uh, um, a new developing a new model of how to work with healthcare staff, frontline healthcare staff, thinking that it's important for them to be able to be fit enough and well enough psychologically to carry out the, their work. And uh, we have worked with uh, five um, NHS trusts in the, in the Northwest and five hospitals. And uh, we are developing this uh, uh, model of work that has three levels, uh, one of release, decompression, um, uh, creative tasks as level one, and working with teams, with existing teams to support their relationships and make sure that uh, new staff that have been redeployed 
connect with others in the um, that are already in operation there. And uh, um, um, also we work on level three with people who uh, um, have been affected by the pandemic, um, display signs of distress and they need, they need support. They need, that's the most classic way of working, I guess. I wonder what are the, some of the key things that we think, what is the contribution? What are the, some important contributions that can be made? Can we summarize them? Can we come up with the ideas that are common across, I guess, the different disciplines? Well, Vicky, if I, if I could uh, make one little observation as you were talking about dance therapy, what was ringing in my mind was the WHO definition of health in general from our 1947 constitution. Uh, we, we define health as not merely the absence of disease, but the attainment of the highest level of physical, mental, and social well-being. And as you were describing the uses of dance therapy, you had a, a physical exercise element to it. You had a, a physical rehabilitation element to it. So the physical side is, is certainly well covered. Uh, you had um, uses of it in combating depression and uh, working through um, uh, emotional trauma. So the mental side is covered. And, and then uh, the social well-being, uh, being able to uh, um, send out uh, important health messages that uh, may improve the health of a community or even create a sense of community, uh, both in small groups and larger groups. So in, in, in some ways, I think, um, just looking at the WHO definition of health, arts therapies uh, can be justified, if we need to justify them, just simply through how we define health at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good point. And I think a, a point that we would all agree on, right? Yes, I would say that it's, uh, I was thinking about, you know, one of the things that theater is uh, terrible at actually is the social distancing. Um, because we come into a small space, we rub elbow, elbows with each other, we breathe the same air, and, uh, and yet at the same time, um, we have found other ways of being able to bring people together to share their stories. And I'm thinking specifically of a group that I uh, co-lead in partnership with Stop PD, and it's a group for adults with Parkinson's at different phases. And in this group, we're using playwriting as a means of being able to comment on experience. And so they, they reflect on their own lives and the invitation is to observe their own experience without judgment and then to translate some of that experience into a dialogue between two characters that they create with distinct voices. And so we're working on um, the psychological capacity to be able to sublimate lived experience and some of their own anxiety and distress around what they're noticing, either around Parkinson's or around the pandemic. But as of a couple of weeks ago, actually for a few weeks now, it's actually been more around protest uh, and movements towards racial justice. And so there's the psychological piece. And then when we get together in the group, we actually purposely work on having different people read uh, for uh, each other's scenes. And it's part of a larger program where we're using theater as a means to also work on rehabilitation goals be it uh, vocal or, or uh, mobility related goals with regards to Parkinson's uh, when, we're, when we're back in the same room together, although we do do a bit of physical work even in the online environment vis-a-vis -vis breathing and stretching. And then of course, there's just the sense of community that develops as we do this each week, right? Uh, but the plays are really tremendous and I will just say that uh, you'll have to stay tuned as we weave them together into something that can be staged might need to be staged here in this online environment uh, or, or at, a, at a stage near you. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about a couple of things happening in Australia with uh, older people, pe particularly people with dementia. And we've had prior to, to COVID-19, we've had some um, dementia choirs where 
um, where couples, where one one of the couple has dementia, they come together and they they have a, this choir, this dementia choir, reminiscing. It's called reminiscing, um, and uh, the the uh, they come together and and they and they treasure these moments, and it becomes the choir becomes their family, and then all of a sudden. COVID-19 kicks in and of course older people are the first people to have to self-isolate so they've continued these choirs online and I think that this is this has been a wonderful opportunity to keep people connected so they and they continue their choir at the same time every week is so trying to keep as much of the normality as possible um, because older people they, they do tend to kind of get um, quite isolated uh, and, you know, for these people with dementia, having music and, and connecting with other people, they're also connecting with the sense of who they are as, as, a, as a person as well. So that whole personal identity expressed through music is, is, um, is so important. And we've got this other, other project, um, Homeside, we call it, where uh, we actually teach um, family carers how to use music with their loved one who has dementia in a very sort of strategic and targeted way to maintain uh, relationships when the person living with dementia tends to um, withdraw and, and have difficulty um, connecting and, and uh, communicating with their, with their carer. And so we've actually moved our whole delivery online now and that's, um, that's working really well because otherwise these um, carers don't really quite know what to do because they're stuck at home 24 7 not even able to get out and go for a walk that where they feel safe um, because they, they uh, might come across someone who has COVID so that so this idea of using something to to fill that space where they're there together all the time 24 7 has been really super important um, I'm thinking about how um, you know uh, Chris earlier talked about uh, when we touched all of us touched uh, on the imagined other, the imagined relationship, the imagination, the as if, and I'm thinking how much um, um, arts and art therapists are very well positioned in imagining, you know, sort of this um, remote relationship as well, right? So we have thrived, and like all expectations, there is a thriving um, uh, ca capacity to be with and online, which we didn't expect. It came a bit as a surprise, I think, for most of us. Um, so that's one, one thing I'm thinking of. The other thing I'm thinking is about the, uh, how we can, um, as art therapists, we're offering one-to-one, -one, we're offering um, groups, but there is an, um, the, um, the social component is more open than the issue around uh, uh, public health uh, and messaging, but also uh, connecting communities, to challenging um, stigma and, and, and um, um, you know, social injustice, you know, the most social component becomes relevant. I don't know whether we... I'd like to comment on that because I think, um, and, uh, you know, it's something that Felicity spoke to uh, and that you've spoken to, actually everyone's spoken to this, um, challenging notions of care. Uh, because as we talk about the arts therapies, we're not talking about them as taking place within 45 minute blocks in closed rooms. We're talking about these open spaces that actually involve family members and involve other community members, um, essentially doing what works. What does, what does this person need and how do we walk with them in an online space or otherwise in order to attune, to use your words Felicity specifically, uh, to uh, what's rising up in the moment. Uh, which requires us to exercise our imagination, our flexibility, and our creativity in order to orient um, what we consider to be therapeutic about our work to what's what's needed in the relationship. Which you know certainly that's a value that we uphold. Um, you know even even prior to the pandemic, I would say that's certainly a value that we uh, have upheld. But I think a lesson that is um, being driven home for me during this time is how care takes, you know, care can be expressed in so many different ways, in so many different contexts, and that we have, um, we have real resources in our, um, in our family members and in our community members 
uh, if we can find ways of resourcing them to be able to draw on the arts, um, to valorize the arts that they already turn to, uh, and to amplify their presence in their lives, that we might be able to see some of the gains that we know are possible um, when we engage in the arts and arts therapies. Okay, Ricky, uh, listening to all the content just now, what I can uh, explain is about, uh, I noticed some similarities and also uh, differences between approach, but then what we uh, care is about uh, how person can accept uh, any modality and how uh, it can tap into the imagination because this something like uh, bypass the cognitive level and also about the important uh, that we need to care about the potential risk to our uh, to, to people to community to society where we receive this because maybe uh, some people they don't aware that this uh, sometimes it hit deep inside uh, the emotional and trigger to trauma so this is something that uh, I notice uh, some similarities and differences between drama therapy music therapy dance movement and then expressive art this is about uh, uh, connection to connect one to another uh, creative form and maybe depend on the person uh, what uh, approach they prefer so this is what uh, are inspired uh, to I mean to contribute uh, to develop in this area okay that's all thank you thank you Asia. Okay. I, Aziza also mentioned sorry Vicky the um, you would also mention when you were speaking early earlier uh, Aziza about uh, symbolic communication and that's yeah. certainly a common thread between all of ours right we're taking lived experience memory hopes for the future and we're translating them through various symbolic uh, means of representation um, because words and numbers are not often enough uh, because there's a great fluency when we draw on all of the art forms mm -hmm. there, there is also something around safety here that um um, I'm hearing from us is so how much do we open how to, how how safe is what we're doing so that's something that needs to be flagged up there is a danger now of, of um, especially in uh, um, um, situations where we're coming out that uh, things are opening up in a, an extent that becomes um, scary and managed overwhelming you know, how is it done in a way that is, um, has therapeutic benefit and has a social benefit as well. So that's, that's something that I think um, 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 it's coming up for me from uh, Aziz's comments there. I think that's a, that's a really, really good point. Um, just thinking about the kind of depth of the work that we can, we can have with people and do with people. And if we're actually not physically there in the room with them, what's our responsibility in terms of taking care of them if, if they open up to the, the emotive aspects of our work. So it's something we, we have to be quite mindful of that we have things in place um, to look after them if they do have some significant emotional response that may be negative. It's not always a positive response um, that we get in the first instant. We hope that any negative response can be transformed into something around <laughs> growth and uh, but in that, in that moment when we're not physically there, that's something we really need to be mindful of. Well, I think it is a different experience uh, and we, we do need to adapt. And like my little introductory talk on, on this session, uh, as Nisha will testify, was, is quite different than uh, what I do as a live performance where I will sing, I will move, I will, you know, um, I, to, to accommodate the, the small screen and the virtual reality, uh, I uh, made everything smaller, you know, in, in that talk. Uh, and when, and there's a whole body of emerging research too, uh, to show the differences between uh, a digital performance and a live performance. Um, in, in a live performance, literally your T cell count goes up, that there, there is a, uh, a healing mode that the body goes into when you're there in person listening to the music, watching the bodies move through space, smelling them, uh, that the physical presence 
it's a it's a deeper biochemical communication. Uh, even our heartbeats begin to synchronize uh, between performer and audience, and that just doesn't happen in a digital environment. Uh, other things do, uh, but it, it's I, I I as we adapt and. I, I worry because, uh, for, for instance, I've been working with uh, the regional theaters in the UK right now, uh, talking to them. They're, they're facing a, a tremendous financial collapse at the moment because of the pandemic. And as people are finding these online alternatives, which began with social media and other things, um, there's a real fear that live performance, actual communal gatherings, um, may disappear, uh, or at least the way we've gotten to know them. And there, there could be a loss there, I think. I wonder about that. You know, I was reading a piece uh, by a colleague uh, around um, intimacy and liveness in the theater. And, you know, why do we keep going back to the theater when we still have so, when we have so many other um, modes of entertainment available to us and liveness is a critical piece. And you, you just spoke I think so. Uh, Christopher, in terms of what the gains are when we do gather together in a room and whether it, when we're experiencing something together. Um, however, I'm noticing the um, new kinds of intimacy that emerge in this space as people tell stories to one another, where actors are reading stories to children in a living room, their actual living room, and they're joining them from their actual, the privacy of their own homes, uh, or um, other examples of uh, theater pieces that have been created lately online having to do with, again, the movement around racial justice, where there is a conversation, there's a performance around experiences uh, connected to protest, moving into a discussion on the spot with the audience that you have uh, on screen with you. Uh, and so there is a, a different kind, there's an immediacy, it's a different kind of immediacy, but an immediacy nonetheless. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I'm, I feel hopeful that we will continue to gather in terms of whether we will continue to gather in person. Uh, I think all I need to do is just look out my window to see uh, folks completely disobeying uh, social distancing rules uh, <laughs> to um, affirm for myself that we will get together and we, <laughs> we, we will seek out any opportunity we can. And uh, apparently here in New York, you know, uh, the, the, if you tell us no, <laughs> don't do it. There's all the greater chance that people are going to do it. Um, <laughs> although I will say that from what I've observed people, you know, in, um, in protests anyways, that there, is a, that there is a mindfulness around social distancing and around caring for one another in the long term as well as in the short term. Can I, um, I start bringing us uh, into a closure and I'm, I'm going to, um, uh, say something as I'm um, picking up from what Christopher was saying at the beginning. Um, uh, catastrophe. Um, I, I'm, uh, my, my mother tongue is Greek, so it was very nice to hear that as a reference point. And the reference to uh, um, uh, turn, uh, it has to do with a turning. And I think that's an important um, a place to be aware of, of where we are. We are at a time where we're turning. How this is, turn, what shape, what direction we're going to take, we don't know yet, but we know we're turning. And we're turning in terms of how we uh, relate with each other, how we use the art form, how we think and rethink and redefine our, um, uh, our disciplines. Um, uh, we, we're turning in terms of how we um, thinking about societies around us and um, um, how, you know, sort of the rethinking the role of the arts in that. Um, so I would like to um, um, uh, stay with a, a, um, an open domain in a way, an open, I don't know where we're going yet, but I, I want to keep hopeful as Nisa is uh, keeping hopeful for some, uh, some new good things also happening through all of that. And uh, I wonder whether we can have a final statement from all of us as a way of closing. Do we need to say anything else before we close? Nisa, I know you, you, you need to summarize some of the... Oh, you know, I will just say, I think you've done a beautiful job of summarizing there, Vicky. And um, I think it, it might actually be a good place 
to end. And, uh, and I just want to thank all of our panelists and thank you, Christopher, for kicking, kicking off the conversation. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.